Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Carta Monier. Um, I am an Ignance award-winning cartoonist. <laughs> and I have the privilege of moderating today's queer romance panel. Um, we have four incredible panelists. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves and then we'll jump into some questions. At the end, we have set aside about 10 minutes to do Q&A. Um, at the point that that happens, we have a microphone in the back. Um, since this is being recorded, we would ask that during the Q&A section, you use the microphone so that um, it picks up in the recording that will eventually go on the SPX YouTube channel. Um, if I can just ask everyone to introduce themselves with um, name pronouns, just a little bit about yourself, um, and then we can jump into the meat of our discussion about queer romance comics. So, hi, I'm Archie, Archie Bon Giovanni. Um, they, them. I just put out a comic called A Quick and Easy Guide to They, Them Pronouns. Mm -hmm. um, I also draw monthly for Auto Straddle, a comic featuring a couple best pals called Grease Bats, and that's out once a month. Um, I'm also an avid zine maker, and I've just started to get into like prints, and uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Hazel Nulevant. They, them. Um, my queer romance comic is Sugar Town. It's a graphic novella that is a queer poly rom-com because I wanted to do some shit about poly relationships. Um, and most of my work is different autobiographical stuff and a lot of it's about feelings and relationships and I also edit anthologies sometimes. Uh, hi, my name is Shauna J. Grant, she, her, and I basically love to be a magical girl. <laughs> I'm the creator of the webcomic called Princess Love Pond, and you can also find me in several other anthologies at your bookstore, including um, the recently released uh, Geeks, oh my goodness, what's it? Um, the Lucky the Loves of Geeks by that Dark Horse put out, I'm um, in the Black Comics Return um, art book, and I'm working on several books right now, including one, can I say? Do it. Yes, okay. <laughs> I'm currently writing a gay magical girl story that I'm super, super excited about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Ed Luce, uh, he, him, and uh, I'm the creator of Wobble Oaf, uh, which is, uh, spends most of its time being a, a romantic comedy um, type of a book. Um, it's also mutated into a couple other genres. Uh, I've done some heavy metal, uh, for heavy metal magazines, some sci-fi tinge stories. There's occasionally some horror. I'm currently working on a, a wrestling, pro wrestling book about a progressive liberal um, wrestling league, kind of the antithesis of the WWE. Um, that has a, a, a just a, a you know pan uh, spectrum of, of characters and identities in that, and I, I can't wait to, to get that out into the world. Awesome. Um, so I've prepared several questions, but I really don't mind if this gets conversational. I <laughs> think that's more interesting. If you're a warning to the audience, we are going to be talking about fucking and. <laughs> Yeah, I can do that. I can do whatever I want. Um, so to open up, um, given that we're talking specifically about um, queer romance within comics, and we have a slideshow prepared that's just going to sort of cycle so you can see examples of everyone's work. Um, given that we're talking about uh, queer romance in comics, I wanted to open by asking specifically what you think is different about the genre of queer romance stories than traditional heterosexual romance and how your approach differs in telling stories that are about queer characters as opposed to more conventional like boy meets girl, um, heterosexual romance stories that have such an honored tradition in comics. Yeah, I, I'll start, I don't know. Um, so I feel like for my own comics, it's never just about two people. <laughs> Um, even if it's like gonna be like, if two people are like monogamous or whatever, it's not just about that. It's about like the community that they're also a part of. Because at least for my life, um, I my most romantic relationships are like actually just like with my pals and with my friends. Um, and so I feel like the way that those interact with rom like 
traditional like romantic um, relationships is kind of like where my focus kind of goes. Mm -hmm. Versus I think oftentimes when you look at a traditional like romantic story, it is just about the two people and like maybe one best friend, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like there's so many more voices. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the differences with queer romance comics are pretty much just like the differences between queer relationships and heterosexual relationships are just like queer identity. Like it's all, um, I'm not sure how it separates in comics specifically, but like, you know, you're having relationships which are divorced from like, you know, just cis het relationship roles and you have to figure out like, who you like and what kind of relationship mm -hmm. you want to have with them um, and like just kind of go your own way and mm -hmm. like invent relationships for yourself or you know mm -hmm. discover these like um, like covered histories mm -hmm. of you know how people like you have been hooking up or mm -hmm. having relationships and um, yeah it just means like revisiting like assumptions about like every single area of like relationships and romance and figuring out how you're gonna do it for yourself. Yeah, so you'd say like there's less of a script to follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like really agree with that. I think that's kind of the fun part about um, queer romance is that you don't have to like fall into the typical boy meets girl and they fall in love you could kind of I feel like it's more easy to explore like friendships becoming more than just friends and mm -hmm. you can like get to the romance on a more intimate level yeah I mean my comic is based in San Francisco and I often think of that as this sort of relationship petri dish for all of the kind of queer <laughs> relationships we're talking about right now and and a lot of uh, the the stories in in my the, the first arc of the book um, uh, the first oaf arc. Um, they're about my own personal experiences, kind of like wading into my eyeballs into the dating scene there, uh, and in particular the the sort of bare dating scene. Um, and uh, in doing so, just uh, you know, having a little bit like almost like a buffet of relationships. Um, kind of allowed me, I think, to speak truthfully about the pros and cons of each of those and, and also to try and represent them truthfully but not be judgmental mm -hmm. about open relationships, poly relationships, mm -hmm. um, relationships that are, are just about hookups. And then there are little kernels of monogamy in there because <laughs> at least in San Francisco, um, you're, you're, I'm going to generalize here and speak from personal experience again, but if you're in a monogamous relationship, you're kind of a freak there right. uh, because it's, it's so open. Um, so yeah, I mean, just kind of trying to also impart that to an audience that may not be familiar with a lot of these mm -hmm. types of relationships. I um, in particular, I have a, a pretty large um, straight readership, and I think that I'm kind of, uh, for better or worse, become an emissary for some of these ideas if people mm -hmm. haven't been familiar with them before. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just trying to explore all the possibilities is really, you know, what I've been trying to do. On the topic of being an emissary for these ideas, um, what sort of pressure do all of you feel to, to put, quote, good representation into your comics? Um, I know it's something that all of us think a lot about and like there's a lot of conversations about it like if you're making messy gay stories like are you risking falling into some um, oh, I'm sorry falling into some um, negative tropes or are you showing the wrong side of our community to cis people or straight people um, so how do you deal with questions of good representation does it factor into your work and if so how please I just try I don't know I like to draw messy stories, and I like to um, trust that the readerships are going to understand that there's like every person is complicated, every character is complicated, and like there's a lot of situations that can be very nuanced. And so, like, there doesn't have to be a right or wrong way um, for a person necessarily to always like be. They can be kind of like I, I like to draw my characters like somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like. To some people, they're going to be like making mistakes and messing up and doing like the wrong actions, and to other people, they're going to be like, "No, they have the freedom to do that." You know, mm -hmm. so I like to give and believe that like my readership that is also like mostly queer um, are going to be able to 
ref feel that nuance like reflected in their own lives. Yeah, I think um, the considerations of good representation have a lot to do with like who we think our readership is going to be. Like, mm -hmm. is it you know important to um, to like make these comics as like a message to give to people who are outside the community of like mm -hmm. here you know try to you know get into our viewpoints try to get into our shoes imagine you know what what shit is like or could be like um but uh yeah i'm definitely always think of myself as writing for a queer audience and mm -hmm. probably you know i don't have a great imagination about it i just imagine writing for other people who are like me who are gonna be you know want to see the complications of um of, of life and of mm -hmm. queer relationships on the page mm -hmm. um well as a black creator i always want to make sure that my stories reflect um, everything I would have liked to see when I was like mm -hmm. 14 year old and trying to figure out like what kind of stories like reflect me so there wasn't a lot growing up so mm -hmm. that's why my art has a very um, shoujo manga taste to it because that was kind of like the closest thing that it was far away from like white suburban life that I was like okay I don't live in Tokyo but I can connect with that a little bit more so um, when I write characters, I kind of think of them as, you know, like what if they did grow up in a lower income area and, you know, they're still into like being really cute and really fashionable because I want to show that, yeah, black girls can be really cute. They can be sensitive and vulnerable and still powerful. And I, writing, um, queer romance with black characters, with young black girls, because I do write my stories more for like a slightly younger age group. Mm -hmm. I want to just show like, yes, you can be however you feel you are. You can love whoever you want. And you can have these characters that also look like you and are experiencing everything that you're going through as well. Yeah, I, I try and be really unjudgmental in how I portray the various types of relationships. Um, and I, I try and leave it up to the reader to decide how they identify with it. You know, for, for, some, of, for some people, the relationships in the book aren't for them. It, other relationships are. They can identify with it a little bit more closely. Um, I always try to uh, portray communication between various partners mm -hmm. in the comic as being the paramount thing. Like, if you don't agree with the type of relationship, you know, one character is in, another will confront them and talk to them about it. And I, I just think that that's sort of the key to any romance mm -hmm. or any sort of long-term romance or even short-term romance is, is talking and, and trying to instill that um, in the audience so that they can kind of, uh, again, feel like a, there's a non-judgmental take on poly relationships or monogamy uh, mm -hmm. or, or just like I said, hookups. Um, so yeah, um, just kind of leaving things open, I think, is, is always been my approach. Mm -hmm. Have you all gotten any sort of pushback from the stories that you've been doing? It sounds like you all pretty much follow like whatever storyline or, um, you know, uh, pairing that you're interested in, are you experiencing people pushing back or saying that uh, you're doing a bad job of representing queer romance or anything like that? Never to my face. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think the most of the pushback that I've gotten on Sugartown has been people saying like, it's too low conflict, where's the plot? And somebody did say that to my face today and I was like, yep, that's, that's 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 how it is. Sorry, like yeah. Um, and but I think that it. I mean, I think that a lot of people, of course, and this has been like such a big discussion on Twitter recently, like queer, fluff, queer, fluffy love stories. You know, there's a lot of people who want like. Um, I mean, just just something that, that goes against the tropes of like tragic queer romance, mm -hmm. tragic lesbians, or like, you know, with this, I was trying to do something about 
poly relationships, which I feel like is just not seen in like barely any types of media, um, much less something that's like a portrayal of like, oh, this can work and it's you know got you know communication difficulties and it's got its own set of challenges, but it's not like ultimately doomed. And I just wanted to do something that's like not a who will they choose type right. of scenario with multiple love interests involved where the problems were other than that. Um, but so, you know, I think a lot of people just find that a really nice experience to read. <laughs> and uh, some people think that it's too low conflict. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, it is low conflict, take right. it or leave it. It's right. got, you know, more struggles about trying to make somebody the perfect mixtape or, you know, right. feelings of low self-worth and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, great. Uh, I want to ask specifically a sex question. Um, when we talk about queer romance and the representation of queer romance, I think it's important to acknowledge that like in the history of our medium, a lot of queer comics have been pornography. Um, and I'm interested to know what each of you think about your decision to portray or not portray sex explicitly in your work um, and the reasons behind it. Because I know that a lot of us like come very close and stop just short. Like I know when I read Wovable Oaf, for example, I was like, I really want to see Wovable Oaf's dick. <laughs> uh, it's in there. It's in that first book. Yeah. It's in the first book. Not enough yeah. though, Ed. <laughs> Um, I need to give you uh, the heavy metal, uh, one of the heavy metal stories. I'll give that to you when we get back Please. to our thing. It's, they censored it. There's so much dick in it. So. <laughs> um, but I would be interested to know like, where that decision falls for each of you. And obviously, like Shauna, I know that you make books for a younger audience, but I'm still interested to know like, where the line is for you. Um, because like, it is very much a part of queer relationships, and I think seeing the ways that people decide to address it can tell us a lot about like the intent behind the queer storytelling. Um, Archie, do you want to start? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so I, I think it is, for me, I think it's a little bit of deciding like what platform I'm showing something mm -hmm. on. Um, so like the comics for Otto Straddle, I can't show explicit sex. I don't know if I even would want to with those characters because they're like, pals of mine, and I don't know if I want to see it either. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to, for them to all talk about it. But um, when it's like my personal work, sex is super important to me. And so I, I want to depict it in the way that feels like honest and natural. Um, and I absolutely like understand and have researched and know the history of like queer sex just instantly being pornographic, mm -hmm. even if it's romantic undertones. Um, and I also think it's really important to not like shy away from it. And I also think it's like something to sometimes celebrate mm -hmm. the fact that we have sex that is also at times, depending on the people involved, at times not the norm. You know, mm -hmm. like there's there's like a history of like flagging, and there's like a history of. Um, doing sex acts that you're not going to see in a traditional rom com, mm -hmm. and I think that those are like fun to depict and they're fun to draw for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I think I hold back on sexual explicitness because um, most of my work is, especially stuff about relationships, is autobiographical. So, I mean, I change everybody's names, but um, yeah, I think, I, I think maybe if I was working with fictional characters, the decisions about like what would be the best way to portray their relationship would be mm -hmm. different, but there's like a certain level where I don't want to put myself out there like that and mm -hmm. where, you know, I don't want to put um, partners out there like right. quite that much because it's like people can, they can, they can figure it out. They can um, put the dots together. Right. Uh, but yeah, I feel like even the amount of like sauciness that is in this book is like feels a little awkward, but I just try to think of it mm -hmm. as like 
this is what would make a good story. And most of the people who are reading this will not know me, and they'll just be right. looking at it as a book. Um, shoot, I feel like I was going to say something else, but I can't remember, so I'll <laughs> see if it comes to me later. Go okay. ahead. Uh, well, yeah, like, so since I do kind of write with, you know, a slightly younger audience in mind, yeah, I do shy away from being, like, explicit with anything, but um, that doesn't mean I would totally, like, not write stories with more sex involved. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate lots of sexual stories and everything, and I kind of, like, pondered, like, writing and drawing one myself, but I just think personally, I haven't reached the point where I feel comfortable doing that gap. Mm -hmm. So like, I'll leave it to others. But um, I do like the idea of like, alluding to sex and like, the emotional and mental changes that could happen after you experience sex with a partner. I think that's you know, a very important part of developing a relationship and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when I started out, uh, I was unfamiliar with a lot of queer comics. This was about 10 years ago. I went to the Alternative Press Expo and, and discovered the Prism Comics booth and was oh, just sure. kind of blown away. I just couldn't believe that here was this one stop shopping opportunity for all these really great uh, books and, and just uh, such a wide variety of voices. Mm -hmm. um, so I picked up the work of Steve McIsaac and mm -hmm. Justin Hall and Dave Davenport and Brad Rader um, and looked at it all and when it came time for me to do my own work I was like these guys are doing it better than I could ever do it mm -hmm. so I decided to kind of focus a little bit more on the the building of the relationship and um, anybody that has has read my book knows that I like it complicated so I wanted to kind of build up to uh, uh, having a, com a complex romance before the actual sex happened um, but I also wanted to leave the the sort of um, the sexual identity of the Oath character open to interpretation as well, and that meant kind of sidestepping showing him in a particular role, whether it was dominant or submissive in his relationship with the Eiffel character. I kind of like the idea of this tiny little guy dominating this big, huge 300-pound guy. Um, so I, I mean, the only sex scene in that book is actually takes place in the dark because the Oath is shy, but if you look at that the panels... That made me so mad, Ed. It yeah. made me so mad. <laughs> if you look at the panels and you, and you read it down and you get your micro... Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a microscopic lens out to look at it. You can kind of see maybe what's going on with it, but but it was very uh, purposeful on my part. Um, <laughs> because the very first comic I ever did was a sort of light um, water sports comic in which the oaf goes into a, a bar and there's a man lying in the urinal trough and he wants him to to have a you know quick experience with him by urinating on him, but the oaf is pee shy and he can't do it. So he goes into a, a partition, a toilet stall, and he urinates over the top of it <laughs> and sort of completes the, the act that way. So as I said, I kind of like it complex, but that's, that's my sort of sad excuse for why I haven't gotten to really explicit <laughs> stuff yet. Um, it's because I, I like it to be a little more complicated. I like you to work for it as the reader to get there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And like, I've been personally visiting um, a lot of like late 80s, early 90s um, gay comics anthologies recently. Specifically, I've been reading a lot of Meat Man. I don't know if any of you have read Meat Man. It's amazing. It's terrible. Um, it's like uh, gay men's uh, comics. It's all pornography. It has some artists who have never done any work outside that anthology. Um, and it's truly amazing. Like. Um, and it was making me think a lot about like the way that we represent sex and romance in our comics because like there is something very liberating about like going into it knowing like okay there's going to be some hardcore sex in this comic but then like the way that people use that as a vehicle to explore like a lot of different emotional situations could be very interesting to me um, do you all think that you would be open to at some point in your careers doing something like with more explicit sex in it? Or is that something that, I mean, Archie, obviously you answered already. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like, is that something that you see yourself doing? Or is it something that um, you uh, think that you're going to leave to others, as Shauna said? I think it would have to get away from auto bio, but I could definitely mm -hmm. see myself making some like, explicit like fandom porn comics you know maybe mm -hmm. like a 
like Eleanor and Tahani from The Good Place. <laughs> okay, that's getting a good response. Maybe next year I'll, I'll try to do it. Um, and, oh yeah, I thought of the other thing that I was gonna say going back a minute is that it's like weird enough to try to do something that's about myself as like a sort of like romantic feelingsy protagonist and know that it's like, hey, it's me. Um, much less like, you know, an object of like sexual desire on the page. But if I ever think that like it's too egotistical or whatever, I always think like Craig Thompson did it with blankets. Like it's fine. It's basically a, it, it, it's a romance story and it's starring him. Wait, does anyone jack off to blankets? I mean, no, uh, this is why, it, I mean, probably, probably. I mean, he jacks off in that, so there's that. Uh, take some handwriting. Um, it's some nice handwriting. Yeah, the, the L's and the P's the, the, and the, the whatever's. Hot blankets, deep cuts, I didn't know were coming this panel. Uh, no, but that's where it's going back earlier about, ugh, Carta, you got me all flustered. <laughs> um, but yeah, so maybe that points to like a double standard about like, you know, straight men maybe yeah, feeling no, more absolutely. comfortable putting themselves in that role. Yeah, absolutely. So, yep. sexy comics, though. Uh. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I, I kind of waited to, to do my sex comic for Heavy Metal, and I thought, like, let's go. It's Heavy Metal magazine. It's it's infamous for its right. how it exposes the, the female body in particular. Um, but what I came up with, as I said, was was so explicit, they would not release it in the print version. So uh, I had to do, they released it in the digital version, but I had, I realized that all of this pent up desire to do it, uh, I kind of overdid it ultimately. <laughs> when the, when the came out. So as I said, I have the uncensored version of it. They, they let me print it and I will, I will definitely get you a copy I of that card. I need it. Um, but yeah, I, I was just like, oh wait, here's my moment. And I, I kind of blew it, no pun intended. So uh, I definitely want to revisit it. I did a sequel to it. Um, that's running currently. The issue just came out in heavy metal now, but it's noticeably dialed down mm -hmm. a little bit. There's still a, a menage a trois that happens. Um, it happens uh, amongst the three physical beings, but their hair is all sentient. So their hair kind of um, copulates in the air above them um, <laughs> as the individual follicles. Each follicle is, a, is an organism. So um, yeah, that's, as I said, I like it complicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, <sighs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks for putting up with like the horny moderator questions. Um, please uh, recommend to me some good queer romance comics that have inspired you, um, because I am always looking for more, and I think I am probably not the only one. And I would be interested to know where each of you are coming from in terms of like the artists who were working um, before you and whose work inspired you to do what you do now. Shauna, mm. uh, go for it. I really like the manga called Girlfriends. Um, I believe it's, I wanna say it's by uh, Milk. I'm not super sure um, the author name, but it was like the sweetest story I ever read and it takes place basically like, you know, between um, high school or, or middle school girls. They kind of start out like begrudgingly as friends and as their, as their school years continue and their friendship deepens, they realize, uh, I think I have feelings for my friend, but is, is that a thing? But I really like it because it's not <laughs> tragic or anything. They actually decide, you know what? Yeah, it's it's just a thing, and we're we're gonna go through it and stay together. And it was like, oh wow, like they don't break up or anything. Like no one's around being like, oh, this is bad. Like they have friends that's like, you're not telling me everything, but I see what's going on between you two. So y'all do it. <laughs> So um, it's really, really nice, and especially if you like something that's kind of like shoujo, it's, it's a very nice comic. And that's called Girlfriends? Yeah, Girlfriends. Okay. Okay, so um, <laughs> every uh, comic that I've ever read always goes out of my head when these type of questions are asked, but um, Archie's comics are a huge inspiration Aww. to me, and I met them like originally <laughs> 
as a fan at TCAF, like Grease Bats is so good and they're just fucking great at showing like, yeah, the nuances of the queer community and like, yeah, how, how these relationships like fit into a broader scene and society. And uh, so, yeah, off the dome, they're, they're a big inspiration. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> someone can maybe help me, because I'm also the same way, where I'm like, as soon as the question is asked, I'm like, what was that comic called, and who was that person that wrote it? Um, does anyone know the comic Happy Mania? Is that what it is? It's a manga? Do you know what I'm talking about? You, it, it, yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I read that when I was like young, and I was like, "This person is messy," and I love it. And like, it's basically like just like terrible kind of romance where this person's like obsessive and just like makes mistakes after mistakes, and like <laughs> consciously is making her own bad decisions. And I yeah. am very into it. Yeah. What was it called again? Happy Mania. Yeah. By can you say that name? Miyoka Ano. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm glad that the word messy keeps getting brought up um, because the one that I, that popped into my head, the only one, um, is really, uh, at least to, in this year, uh, very problematic. Um, it, and I'm going to probably butcher the, the name of it. It's a little tricky, so if someone in the audience knows it, it I believe it's called Tom and Dickless Harry. Um, and it's by Brad Rader, and it's about these two truckers who are, you know, they, do you know this, Hazel? Yeah. Um, so you know how rough it actually is. Um, these two truckers, you know, they, I think one of, or both of them live relatively hetero heterosexual um, lifestyles, but as truckers, they have these hookups that are, you know, both heterosexual, um, queer, uh, and uh, one of them is a real horrible person. I couldn't tell you which one it is, but he wakes up uh, one day uh, with a vagina uh, in the place of his penis. And this really beautiful romance kind of grows out of it between him and, and the other um, the, uh, cis uh, character, male character. Um, and it, it just blew my mind. And the way it's drawn, it's drawn in different styles from chapter to chapter. One looks like Tintin, the next is really rough, like uh, some of the Meat Men um, comics yeah, that you're yeah. talking about. So, but the, the parts of it that are less problematic for me and that I enjoyed and, and was inspired by were where they actually start to build a romance in this with this different set of you know genitalia that suddenly opens all these possibilities for them. So Ed, how mean would you say I have to be to wake up with a vagina? <laughs> this guy is awful. And as I said, like you'd have to be I don't want to go into details, but yeah, like you would you would have to like yeah. No, it's in the in the in the story. It's a punishment, which is why it's partially problematic. But at the end of it, it teaches him to be a better person. Yeah, yeah. So, so I as I said, going into it, it's really problematic, and it doesn't hold yeah. up today. But the the parts of it that if you can kind of compartmentalize that, uh, you might get something out of it. I, I thought that it, it it taught that character that he needed to be more of a human being um, than he had been up until that point. Yeah. So Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Um, just that hot trans girl humor. Um, <laughs> What's that? Uh, if I can recommend, also, um, I have recently been, as far as a problematic fave goes, I've recently really been enjoying um, John Blackburn's comics, um, his Coley comics that came out through the Fantagraphics Eros imprint in the early 90s. Um, they are, again, like problematic with a capital P, like, mm -hmm. um, but he draws very, very pretty boys. Um, and it's just a lot of like very weird, sort of like pulp adventure sex comics. Um, and they're largely out of print, but um, I really like those as far as sort of like your extremely libertine pornography um, comics. Um, I don't know, this is, a boring recommendation, but if you've never really spent a lot of time with them, um, Dykes to Watch Out For is a great strip um, that inspired many of us, I think very directly inspires a lot of Archie's work still. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I also recently read uh, Hothead Paisan and mm. really fucking loved it. Um, and uh, for a comic that's all about like a hyper feminist woman killing men. Um, it's like extremely trans positive. Um, 
and she has a trans girlfriend, and it's great. I really enjoyed it. So um, if you have a strong stomach, I would recommend both of those <laughs> books. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes, so I would like to open it up for uh, audience questions. Um, again, we have a microphone in the back that's being set up, so if you would like to ask a question of the panelists, I would request that you um, form a line, I guess, at the microphone. Um, thank you. Hello. My name is Jeremy, and I'm just kind of wondering, um, recently there was a dust up uh, about what happened with uh, Voltron the legendary defenders about um, Shiro and his dead boyfriend. How, what do you think you all can do to communicate to the mainstream media to have more inclusive, more representative uh, queer romance in mainstream properties? Well, as someone who does want to write for a younger audience, um, a lot of that is to kind of normalize, like, yeah, kids can see, you know, uh, queer relationships, and it, it's not going to break them. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, what happened in Volchant was, like, really disappointing, especially since they kind of, like, hyped it up so much. I guess if they didn't hype it up so much, it wouldn't be, like, as big of a deal, it's like, oh, okay, business as usual. But since you're like, oh yeah, he's gay, like that's so great. It's like, okay, but I, I kind of like just like forgot the character was there because it was just so minuscule. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question was also like, how can um, the creators of this panel um, work to bring queer relationships to a more mainstream audience. Is that something that you have thoughts on? It's never something I really thought about because I don't know if I ever really wanted or have, I mean like, I don't really want to cater my work towards a mainstream audience mm -hmm. when it comes to like fiction comics, um, at least nonfiction's a different story, but um, Otherwise, I just want to like draw what I want to draw, and if I want to draw like messy, gay people, like then mm -hmm. I don't want to do it. And I feel like just like I don't know if I, like, as a creator I have a chance to make it go more mainstream, more of like people who like the work and are like, no, oh, you should read this. Like mm -hmm. I feel like it spreads on its own a mm -hmm. little bit. Yeah, I think the lack of gatekeepers and licensors and all of these different steps that are required to make like a DreamWorks Netflix show that we can just do whatever the fuck and immediately put it online or mm -hmm. photocopy mm -hmm. it like you know does give us the opportunity to create that like not watered down what we want to see and right. then um, I guess the struggle is getting it out there and getting the stuff that we're doing into the mainstream and it's like, you know, who knows, like the people, you know, like also like we've been talking about like the division between like the, you know, the cis hats and the queer audience, but you never know which of those cis hats are gonna, you know, which of those eggs could be cracked or, you know, anything <laughs> by um, all of them seeing our work. <laughs> yes, yes, You're, we're here for that. Um, but yeah. I don't know. I guess I guess we just need more of our things to become Netflix shows and get picked up or something. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. Like, let's all get our stuff adapted into cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anne, go ahead. Yeah. But my question's actually neatly dovetails from um, Jeremy's, but actually, what I well, so mainstream media has had this horrible problem of creating a body dysphoria and most people who identify as queer, right? Because we're not seeing ourselves portrayed accurately or at all. And that's what's so amazing about queer comics, right? Is these are actual visual representations of people who look like us and act like us. But I wonder too, because of romance and sex and erotica necessarily being about creating, you know, chemistry and attraction, how 
much of a responsibility you each personally feel toward depicting a, a reality or a fantasy of what you think your, you know, your body should look like portrayed or actually is in real life? Ed, do you want to start down? Yeah, I was going to say, it's a tricky one because I, I felt that very much um, moving to San Francisco, being smaller and very skinny and um, being attracted to much bigger men, um, that uh, at least when I, I first came out and I started you know, my foray into the bear community, it was all bear on bear. There was no bear on boy or bear on, on smaller guys. So my experience was really about trying to say, no, there, there is that to be had out there. So I've always been really invested in showing different body types. I mean, yes, the, the larger guy, the rounder guy is kind of predominant because that's the titular oaf. But I wanted to show that um, skinnier guys can be desired. Ex you know, especially hairy men can, can be desired because they often don't f feel that way. They often feel very self-conscious about that. Society is telling them that they're unattractive and they're supposed to be laughed at. So um, that, again, has not been my reality. I've really tried to, to push forward this idea that you should just love who you are and own who you are and, and go out into the world and respond to the people that respond to you and, and treat you with respect and desire. So. Yeah, I feel like it's, um, I think, queer people are really great at this. Um, not that you can't always improve, but like I feel like part of it is like we have to like deconstruct attractions to a little bit, because otherwise if you just kind of like coast through life, you'll coast on like what I believe you more or less coast on like what society has kind of like taught you to be attracted to it. Like um, what we've been like learned is acceptable and I think that queer people just kind of a little bit by existing and then also I think a little bit by like work and thinking and um, processing are better at realizing like, oh no, like these, the kind of like chemistry and the kind of attraction, the kind of bodies that are out there that are like sexy, beautiful and like hot are like varied and all over the, they're all over the place. And mm -hmm. so I think, um, I think it is like a conscious choice for a lot of artists to like make sure that those are depicted mm -hmm. because it's like, honestly like what they're also attracted to. Right. right, yeah, I think having, you know, divorced ourselves from the assumption that we should be attracted to, you know, different gendered cis people, like once you get rid of that, like the other assumptions about who is attractive can uh, fall pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Shauna, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, this is something that I definitely do want to explore more in my own work. I know, like, right now, I'm more focused on, like, showing, like, non-stereotypical, like, characters of color, because, like, you usually see them, like, in a certain kind of way. It's like, no, they can be like this also, but um, I'm learning a lot more about everything um, non-binary. Like I have a lot of friends that have come out recently to me as that, and I really appreciate like just learning like so much. Like I grew, I grew up in the Bronx. I went to like a little Christian school. Like it's taken me like several years to kind of like come to terms with my own sexuality, and so I'm just kind of like slowly like exploring it all in my work also. I hate to double dip too, but I, I'm always about destigmatizing age in the gay community or in the queer community as well. I, I feel like uh, the popular wisdom amongst a lot of gay men is you, you're dead after you know 30 or 30. 35 or something like that, and life goes on. You can still be desirable, you know, after that age. Okay, we have another question. Hello. Um, first, really happy you brought up hothead paisan. Oh. Um, <laughs> I just, I didn't expect that. That was like my favorite comic in the 90s. It was really important for me growing up queer to have that because I didn't really have much. Um, so um, my question's about mental health. Um, there have been a lot of great panels here I've gone to on like, right, like mental health representation and as I'm sure everybody knows, like the queer community is really vulnerable to mental health issues, especially just having a queer story, it's like, it's, it's, it's almost, it feels almost impossible to have that and come out without 
things, like, like things that you need to suss through, things you need to unpack, mental health issues, and a lot of people don't have access, and mm -hmm. things of that nature. How do you, um, I, I guess my question is like, how do you approach that in your work, or is it something that you think about? Are there, do you have storylines? dealing with like anxiety and depression and again growing up in, um, a, in a black community it's kind of like it's like extra double down like we don't talk about these things it's just you know it's like pray about it like hey you have a roof over your head be happy so um, yeah it's also kind of one of the things that like inspired uh, my princess love Pond comic is dealing with those um, like insecurities and like unhappiness and like yeah you're not always going to feel okay and that is okay you know you're still good even mm -hmm. if you know you don't feel good right now mm -hmm. and yeah. <laughs> I feel like it, the way that it plays out for and like at least in Grease Bats is that it's there will be various characters that will be dealing with depression or anxiety or self-doubt um, or like whatever. Um, and I always like to play out like different ways that we can kind of like hold each other up mm -hmm. because I, instead of, I don't know, even if it's just like I'll wallow with you right. or I'll get wasted with you or like something like that, like I feel like that's at least how I kind of like address it in my comics. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I, I haven't addressed it in the, the, the arc that I'm currently working on, but, but um, in the band, uh, or in the comic, there's a band uh, that is essentially one big polyamorous relationship, and the, the lead singer of the band is, is sort of has, to varying degrees, emotional and physical relationships with each of his bandmates, and it's becoming abusive. So I'm definitely kind of moving towards uh, approaching that, that the, the, one of the main characters is, is kind of an abuser, and I want to make sure that uh, I explore that, uh, at least in terms of making sure that the other band members have a voice and that they're kind of taking care of themselves. They're engaging in that self-care, that they remove themselves from that relationship. And I can show that they have, you know, their self-worth isn't defined by that, um, that they can move on and have relationships of their own after that. Cool. I don't have a smart answer to this. It's just, it's, it's in there, you know? I yeah. talk about my own experiences with like abusive relationships or, you know, people around me's experiences with depression and suicidal ideation and like, yeah, I don't have like a great uh, thesis on it, but you know, doing auto bio work, it's a part of my life, it's a part of the lives of the people that I'm close to, so it's in there and you know, it doesn't offer solutions, but hopefully just by you yeah. know, people feeling seen and not alone, that that's a little bit of a help in itself. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, like, when it comes to mental health, there often aren't concrete solutions. Um, so even depicting the struggle as a normal part of life rather than as, like, you know, a horrible aberration um, is an important way to normalize and um, help readers who might not have come across that sort of representation before. Right, and it figures into romantic relationships so much too, like that's easily a part of queer romance is like, you know, supporting partners with mental illnesses mm -hmm. or one's own experience with mental illness like highly factors into like any development of a relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we are pretty much out of time. Um, so I would like to thank all of our panelists. This was a really lovely discussion. Thank you, Archie, for coming out. Um, I know that we have like about 30 minutes of SPX left, um, but can everyone just quickly plug where people can find your work online after the show? Yeah, so one, um, you can still find me at J12. That's where my table is if you want to purchase things now. Uh, but otherwise, like archiebongiovanni.com is my website. You can find me on 
um, Instagram, which is where I post actually most of my stuff right now, mm -hmm. is um, baby wrist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, grease underscore bat is my Twitter. I'm right next to Archie upstairs, so you can hit us both up. And just uh, if you Google my last name, New Levant, all my stuff will come up. And I'm working on um, a longer graphic novel right now that is going to be out next year. So the um, mini comics and the short pieces are kind of infrequent right now. But if you want to follow along with that process, then my Twitter is the place to do that, at H. New Levant. at shaunadraws.com and on Twitter at shaunadraws and if you're interested in seeing my webcomic it's at princesslovepond.com it's on a bit of hiatus right now because I'm working on several different books but um, yeah definitely look out for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm at N14 across from Fanographics upstairs and if you type wovable oaf uh, it being a kind of tongue twister um, into any social media uh, it, something of mine will pop up um, but I also have wovableoaf.com as well. Cool, and I'm Carter Monier. I'm the only one, so. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank Have a you. nice one.